If you knew God would deliver you from all your fears, how different would your life be? You wouldn't see them ever again? So your fears are specific people? Snakes. So the fact that I've got one here tonight. You have a love in that? Okay. Who else? How much differently would you live if you were not living in fear? If you were not living in fear or something. Well, we would be, well, the world would actually be all happy. Yeah, I don't know about all that. How spiders going to make the world happy and happy? Snakes have a purpose, and so do spiders. They help control the rodent population. There's some spiders that help control the rodent population. Hey, hate spiders. Have you seen a spider in Australia? Those things are like the size, they're the size of poodles. They're huge. There's these trapdoor spiders that like it looks like there's nothing there, and then they jump out from under a hole and grab something, and go back down, and the ground just pops back down. They like burrow into the ground, and there's a little trap door. That's why they call them spiders. They live in Australia. Mom will die. Anyway, so for me, like I've always wanted to go skydiving, but it's that fear of like hitting the ground and not being able to wake up. That's what gets me. But. Me and Jonah kind of made a deal that whenever he turns 18, we're going to go skydiving. So I've got, you know, nine years to get my act together to not be scared. Yeah, because he's nine. He'll be 10 this year. I know. I keep looking back at pictures from when we first got here, and he was tiny. Also, next month, Kayla and I will have been here for four years. Really? Yeah. Why is it in May? I will be here for four years. But, so for the last two weeks, we've been talking about being single and being married. This week we're shifting just a little bit. Um, we're not talking about that stuff anymore. We're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but instead of talking about that, we're going to be discussing what we should do when we have to accept where God has called us to be. So we're accepting where God's called us. So some of us are afraid to go to different places or to do different things, but tonight I really want to discuss being content in the content. And that's the title of the sermon, is being content in the content. Now you can put the pizza box up. Um, some of y'all love the contents of this box, right? Yeah. No, no, no. I was hungry. But I was, I was hungry. But if you come to Blacklight Dodgeball a week from Saturday, there will be pizza. But, so tonight we're talking about being content with where God has you, being content with the contents of your life. So, first of all, I'll tell you this. I want you to be who God called you to be. We're starting with the first verse, verse 17, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, and I've titled that, or I've made that out to be, as come as you are. So let's look at verse 17, and it says, only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk, and so I direct in all the churches. Basically, what that's translating to is, come as you are. God doesn't expect you to clean yourself up or to make yourself pretty before you come to repentance. We've gotten in a really bad habit in the church of having this expectation that lost people are supposed to act like Christians. And we're shocked when they don't. And so what God is saying, and, he, and Jesus says this time and time again, he tells us that we don't have to worry about trying to fix ourselves because we are incapable of doing so. I can't fix myself. You can't fix yourself. Only God can do that. So the Corinthians had a problem here accepting their current situation. If you remember in the previous verses, it talks about how some of them were trying to get divorces, some of them were trying to remain single, some of them were trying to get married. They were trying to, to change physical things about themselves. Does this, like, does this sound like you or like somebody that you know? Do you know someone that's constantly trying to change themselves? Let me ask you this, ladies. How many of you wear makeup? I wear mascara. I stop wearing makeup. Put mascara count down. Mascara count. Are you changing something about yourself? Yeah, I'm trying to my eyelashes darker. Then you're just like the Corinthians. You're looking in the mirror, you're not satisfied with how God made you, and so you want to change it. I'm just saying, all of us have something that we want to change. And this is the same thing the Corinthians are wrapped up in, but they were so wrapped up in it that they was causing them to struggle in their faith. And this is why Paul felt the need to express this or to address this. We've been fed this lie, like I said before, that God expects us to clean ourselves up, to make ourselves look pretty before we come to him in repentance. And like I said, that's a lie. God does not expect you to fix yourself before you come to him. We're incapable of doing that. For the Corinthians, God had placed them in the situations they're in, and they should be content with where they are. And it's the same with us, and we'll get to that in a little bit. They shouldn't be content in their situation because 
you know, they're happy or because it's easy or perfect. Because all of us can come to the point where our lives are not going to be easy and our lives are not going to be perfect. But we're content because we belong to Christ. Our contentment, our fulfillment comes from Christ, not from the world, not from what we can do in the mirror or any kind of surgeries we can have. It comes directly from Christ. Some of you may think you can't do anything right, or your parents may think that about you. Has anybody ever heard you can't do anything right before? I heard it a lot when I was a kid. Um, God says, come as you are. You may be dirty. You might, you'll probably have sin in your life, things that you struggle with, things that you're ashamed of, that you can't fix. But don't let those things stand in the way of coming to know Christ. If you spend your entire life trying to fix yourself, you will have wasted your life. Only Christ can fix you. Only Christ can change your heart. Only Christ can make you into the person that he has created you to be. When you try to live like the world, you're never going to be that person that is fulfilled because that fulfillment comes directly from Christ. The truth of the matter is none of us are worthy of God's salvation. None of us are worthy of his love. But he chooses to love us anyway because that's the kind of God that he is. He loves us so much that he extends, us, extends salvation to us. We can't clean ourselves up enough to stand before God. Before I leave my house in the morning, I take a shower. I've got this weird fear that I always stink. And so I always take a shower first thing in the morning. It doesn't matter if I'm going to Walmart. Unless I go to the gym where I know I'm going to sweat. I always take a shower first because I don't want to stink. God doesn't care about my stench. And a lot of us have stinky hearts, so to speak. We have sin in our lives, and we have things that whenever we struggle with sin, instead of going to God, we try to run away because we feel like we shouldn't be in his presence. But God wants your problems. God wants your issues. God wants your heart. And he's telling you, no matter what is going on in your life, I am still here waiting for you to understand that. And so we've got to stop running away from God whenever things get difficult. We need to really just lean into him and focus on who he is. Through Christ and his righteousness, we are able to approach God and to stand or kneel at his feet. Matthew eleven twenty eight shows us God's love for those who know they're broken. The verse says, come to me, all you are weary, all you are heavy laden, heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. It doesn't tell us to, come, to go and fix your problems and take a nap and then come and find me. God says, come as you are. Bring your problems. Bring your anxieties, bring your depression, bring all these issues that you have going on in your life and give them to me. And I will give you that rest that you're seeking. I will give you that peace that you need. God created us with the need for him. All of us worship something, whether it's God or the world or something else. We all worship. How we spend our time shows what or who we worship. Even atheists worship something. They just don't want to admit it. But God created us with the need for him. He knows we're incapable of fixing ourselves. When Christ did a miracle, this is what's awesome about Jesus. Whenever Christ did a miracle, he didn't tell them, you fix yourself before I save you. He said, I forgive you of your sin, and then he gave the blind man his sight. He didn't tell the blind man, go find an optometrist and get some contacts or some glasses and then come and find me afterwards. He didn't tell the lame man, you better stand up and walk before you come and see me. He said, I forgive you of your sin, now get up and walk. He saved his soul, and then he fixed his problem. He does this over and over with Scripture. He wants people that are humble and show humility and show desperation to come to him. And he's going to save their souls. And then he may heal you a little bit too. But we've got to get away from this idea that we have to fix ourselves because we can't do it. The greatest thing about it is salvation comes from what Christ has already done, not from anything that we can accomplish. We can't save ourselves. Christ has already done that for us. How do we do that? We repent of our sins. We trust Christ to be our Savior, and then we follow him. Then after this, you become a child of God. Not everyone is a child of God. Everyone is God's creation. But only those that have repented and followed Christ are a child of God. And so now let's look at this. You are God's child, verses 18 and 19. It says, Was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has anyone been called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is keeping the commandments of God. God uses humble people in their situations to reach the people around them. The awesome thing about God's kingdom is that anyone that's willing to repent and trust him, he allows to come in. Looking at the Old Testament, we see that God used a man who had a speech impediment to free the Israelites, being Moses. We see that God used a prostitute to prevent two spies from being killed so that those same two men could come back later and destroy that city of Jericho. 
And then what's really cool about this processing is she's actually in the genealogy of Christ. And that's Rahab. One of the most despicable people you can think of is actually a great, great relative of Jesus. God uses people that are willing to humble themselves. He used someone that everyone thought was a madman in John the Baptist to usher in the coming of the Messiah. Someone that everyone thought was crazy. You know, wild honey and locust, he was out in the, in the woods in the desert being a weirdo. The Pharisees had no explanation for it. They thought he was crazy. And he helped to usher in the kingdom of God. He used a man who murdered Christians for pleasure to become one of the most prolific people in the New Testament, being Paul. You know what all these people have in common? They showed humility. And God saw that in them and used them for his glory. If God can use people like these, he can use people like us to do what he's called us to do. He calls those who understand that the world doesn't revolve around them. The world does not revolve around you. It does not revolve around me. It revolves around the sun. Literally and figuratively. He calls those who understand this, those that are willing to humble themselves, to cry out to him and let him be the Lord of their lives. You guys are in a very difficult position right now because you are seeking acceptance from the world. You want affirmation from people that have no idea who you are. That's why we do things on social media to get likes. That's why we do stupid stuff in school to get attention. We're seeking affirmation from people that are not that important. You're supposed to be seeking affirmation from Christ and not from man. Because when you, when you die and you stand before God, none of the things that you use to get popular are going to be beneficial to you. The only thing that's going to matter is if you have a relationship with Christ. And so your affirmation comes from God. Your identity, your value, your importance comes from God, not from the world. When we are saved, God changes us to be more like Him. So we no longer have to worry about keeping up with the norms of society. We don't have to worry about fitting in. Because the thing about culture is it shifts about every five to ten years. And what was cool ten years ago in Mao was just embarrassing. The words that I used as a teenager are no longer used. I mean, y'all used words six months ago that now if you use them, you get laughed at. Because they're not popular anymore. There's a reason why you guys are so stressed out all the time. Why are you so anxious? Because you don't know who you are. Because you're chasing after fads of the world when you really need to be chasing after Christ. When your identity is in Christ, you don't worry about what's going on in the world when it comes to popularity or trying to fit in or trying to be that important person. Because Christ tells you you're his. You belong to him. And that's all that matters. You don't have to worry about keeping up with slang and everything else. God uses people that seek him out, that love him, that hate sin, that strive for holiness. They don't want to be prideful and they don't care about self-gratification. This generation now is all about gimme, gimme, gimme. Anything they can get their hands on, they want. Self-gratification is the most important thing. If it makes me feel good, that's all that matters, no matter what it does to anyone else. God does not want to use people like that. There's not a single character in Scripture that was like that, and God used them for His glory. He used humble people. Whenever we come to Christ, our personality is still the same. But we belong to God now and not ourselves. Or in reality, the devil. If you don't belong to God, you belong to the devil. So you've got to understand that as well. You are either a child of God or you are a child of Satan. There is no in between. So who do you belong to? The Corinthians struggle to understand this as well. They were so caught up with their sinful culture that many of them either wanted to hang on to as much of it as possible. They wanted to have salvation, but they wanted to have the world too. Or they felt like they needed to do the job of the Holy Spirit for him. So they felt the conviction that they had they needed to force on everyone else. A lot of us fit into one of these two categories. Which is why Paul goes through these verses and asks him, if you were circumcised, are you required to be uncircumcised? He says what matters is keeping the commandments of God. What matters is being obedient to the one who saved your soul. Not worrying about the world, not trying to change physical features, or trying to change something to make you fit in culturally. Which is what, why he's talking about circumcision here, because the Jews and the Gentiles had two completely different understandings of culture. Jews were taught from the Old Testament with Abraham that they needed to be circumcised to be a part of the covenant of God. The Gentiles were not. And so they had these Judaizers or these men that were Jewish Christians that would come and tell them the only way for you to have salvation is for you to be circumcised. And Paul was telling them, this stuff does not matter. You don't have to change your physical appearance to fit in with God. The only thing that really needs to be circumcised is your heart. The only thing that needs to change is who you belong to. Your culture is still going to be there. Your personality is still going to be there. But you no longer belong to the devil. You belong to God. You are a child of God now. 
And so worry about that. Don't worry about keeping up the culture. Be faithful and obedient to God. As a child of God, your long ride required to satisfy cultural norms. Can I tell you a secret? You don't have to worry about pleasing anybody except for God. You don't have to worry about being popular. You don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Because for most people, once you graduate high school, a lot of those people you're never going to see again. And if you spend your entire school career trying to be popular, trying to fit in and everything else, by the time you graduate, you're not even going to know who you are. We had one of our small group leaders a couple years ago when I was doing testimonies. This person said that they sought out every accolade they could. And by the time they graduated and went to college, they didn't know who they were anymore because their whole identity was wrapped up in academic. What's your, what's your identity wrapped up in? Is it in Christ or is it trying to fit in with somebody else? You know, we still have a personality. Your joy, your fulfillment, it no longer comes from the world, it comes from God. We're all different people. We may have things in common, but our personalities, what we like, what we dislike, they're different. And as long as it's unbiblical, it, it's not a bad thing. You're going to have friends that I'm not going to be able to reach. You're going to have friends that just don't like me because of who I am. But you have an opportunity to share the gospel with people that I never will. You've got a social circle around you that you talk to, and I guarantee every one of you has got at least one lost friend. Share the gospel with them. Show them Christ. Show them why you should be a child of God. Lead by example. Show them what it means to be a follower of Christ, not just in word, but in action. Show them that humility, that you care more about them than you care about yourselves. Pray for them. Invite them to church. Share Jesus with these people. God gave everyone of some mind, a personality, and a way to be faithful to him and to reach the people around us. We just have to do it. God uses our personality, our demeanors, our preferences to reach different people. Each one of you, again, you have people that you can reach on the rule of the ocean. So just be faithful to that. Let me ask you another question. How many of you would like to live somewhere else? If you can, if you could not live in Jessup, would you like to live somewhere else? Yes. Yes. Raise your hand. Let's see. Almost everybody? Okay. If you could move anywhere in the world, where would you go? Australia. With the giant spider? Yeah. No, Canada. <laughs> Why Canada? I have my room. Okay. She wants to see Finley. She wants to see what? Finley. What is that? An 18 year old. An 18 year old. Alright. I don't keep both of them. So, so. He probably has cooties. He probably does. What about you? Where would you want to move to? Yeah, alright. Sam, how about you? Um, Australia. Yeah. Australia. 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 Man, I don't want to. Or Arizona. She can say Arizona. Okay. I try to avoid a land like the lake. He has bananas up there. Yes, Ansley. I thought you said a mental institution. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow. I want to live in either Arizona or Australia. Okay. What about you? If you could move anywhere in the world, where would you go? Yes. Too cold. Hawaii. Hawaii? Oh, yeah. Why is that? Okay. I want to move to Alaska. Why? I love cold weather. It's beautiful up there, and I could probably kill a polar bear. I heard that if you shoot a polar bear, they bleed Coca-Cola. I don't know if that's true or not. But, okay, what about this? If you could live in any time period. Yeah, we can go back to you. 1920s? 1920s? Because the flapper dance, the flappers and the bobs. The and there was a lot of things going on. Jazz age. Yeah, the Great Depression was coming up pretty quick. <laughs> oh, the 1980s. Why the 1980s? That was because big hair. Um, yeah. yeah. And they had great songs. Yeah, they had great music. Because that's literally the only music I like. I was. I grew up in the 90s. And we had some pretty good music too. Yes. 90s all the way up to like 2015. Yes. Yeah, like. Why is that? What do you care? Cool. I would want to live in like the the 1100s because the castles and all that stuff. Like British history really like interests me. Yes. 40s. 1940s or like the the 80s 40s. What's the 80s? I want to be there right after Christ crucified. 1940s. What was going on in the 40s? World War II. Do you want to be a participant in World War II? You know, like millions of people died over a couple inches, right? Yeah. Wow. The Great Trench Wars. Well, that, that might be World War One. 
I think it was World War I. Okay, anyway, so let me ask you this last question. Why do you think God did not put you in those places around that time period? He wants us to be here. You guys have a purpose for being right where you are. So, let me tell you this. What Paul tells us next is to be present where you are. God has a reason for you to be here in Justin, Georgia in 2021, and it's not to wear six masks on your face. <laughs> we're all guilty of getting called up, looking at other people's lives and fantasizing about where we're going to live, what we're going to do, how much money we're going to do. You know, we all want to be whisked away somewhere else. But the thing about social media is a lot of that stuff they put on there is fake. Do you guys realize that? A lot of those people that post these happy videos and happy pictures and everything else are probably depressed and struggling. But whenever you post only happy things, people don't really see who you really are. And so then everyone else thinks that you're perfect. And then when they're struggling, they think, well, I just want to be like this person. And then you don't know how to cope because you don't see one actually living out an example of something that you're dealing with. And so we've got to quit getting caught up in fantasy lives. But, you know, we're all guilty of this. If we were rich, we wouldn't have any problems, which that's also a lie. We can buy whatever we want. Life will be easy, or at least that's what the world tells us. I wouldn't mind making more money. Let's be honest. I don't think anybody in here would be would mind making a little more money. <laughs> you can sell the Boston bus. But, you know, when I was younger, I wished that I would have grown up with my dad in my life. And I've talked to you guys about my dad before. But that was a painful experience for me dealing with the fact that my dad abandoned me, that he didn't want me, and he still doesn't want to talk to me now. I've tried to reach out to him several times, and he ignores my calls, ignores my messages and everything else. And so I've kind of just given up on that. And it's going to be up to God whether or not he reunites us. I've forgiven him. I used to hate him. When I was your age, I hated my dad because he left me. But God used this experience to make me into the man I am now. He used that to turn me into who I am. Had I grown up with my dad, I'd be a completely different person. My dad is not a good man. He cheats on his wife on a regular basis. He's got five kids that we know of. My sister still doesn't know if he has more kids or not. I could have potentially grown up to be just like him. Had I been raised by him. God knew what he was doing. God decided for me not to know my dad and use that as an opportunity for me to be able to have a genuine discussion with some of you that may be growing up in broken homes. Because I can identify with what you're going with. I don't have to read it in the textbook or imagine it because I felt that pain. I understand it. And so what was painful then I can use for God's glory now because I can help you. So instead of hoping for a better life, we should really be ignoring the distractions. Let's look at verses 21 through 24. It says, Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you were able also to become free, rather do that. For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one of you is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. You're where God placed you. Now, let's think about this for a minute. That's a really bold statement to make when there's people being abused. When there's people dealing with broken homes with the, you know, addicted parents and everything else. How do we go about justifying that God, that's where God wants us to be? I don't think if any of us had the opportunity to choose to be in an abusive household, we would choose that, right? I don't think anybody would say, yeah, I really want to be beat by my parents. I really want to be abandoned by my parents. It's tough. I mean, these are some difficult questions that we have to answer as believers to people that are going through these situations. But the thing is... God can use these situations that we're currently going through to reach people in the future. You know, 20 years ago when I was living that, I didn't think that God was ever going to be able to redeem that because I hated God too. And now here I stand able to talk to you about these kind of things. We're placed where we are for a specific purpose, for a specific reason, so that we can be empathetic to others who would go through this as well. That means we can understand what they're going through because we've already dealt with it. It does not mean that it's going to be easy. It does not mean that it's just going to magically make the pain go away because sometimes I still live with that pain 20 years later. But God has used that for his glory. Paul addresses this in verses 21 and 22 where he talks about, he says, if you were a slave before, don't worry about it. Although if you gain your freedom, do it. For those that were slaves are now free in Christ and those that were free are now slaves to Christ. He's telling us our freedom does not come from man. Your freedom does not come from a person on this earth. It comes from Christ. So no matter what your external circumstances are, you have freedom in Christ if you are a believer. No matter how bad things can get, 
you still have freedom in Christ because you know that no one can take away that salvation that God has given you. They may take your life, but they can't take away your salvation. Even a slave can be free if they're a child of God. But he tells them, you know, if you have an opportunity to get out, get out. If you have an opportunity to leave an abusive home, get out. That's what scripture tells us. If you have an opportunity to get out of an abusive marriage one day, hopefully you'll never get in that position. Get out. God cares about your safety. God cares about your well-being. But we can't let ourselves get so wrapped up in our external circumstances that we miss Christ in our lives. Whenever Peter was walking off the ship, whenever the storm was going, he had his eyes on Christ. He started walking on water. What happened whenever he took his eyes off of Christ? He started sinking, and he cried out, God, save me. In our situations in life, we have the same opportunity to keep our eyes on Christ. But as soon as we take our eyes off of him, we start sinking as well. And the, the sea of depression and the sea of doubt and the sea of pain and everything else starts to overtake us until we finally look at Christ and say, God, save me. We've got to keep our eyes on Christ no matter what's going on. Then he makes a point to tell us that we were bought with a price. We belong to God now. If you are a Christian, you belong to God. Because of this, we should never purposely or accidentally get back into a position where we can be enslaved by someone. Now, this could be literal enslavement, but it could also be any time that someone has control over you that causes you to do something that is contrary to your faith. Never get in a position that's going to compromise your faith. Never get in a position that's going to make you be less than who God created you to be. That's in relationships. That's in businesses in life in general. Never date someone that demeans you, that makes you do things that the Bible says is sin. Stay away from those people. Paul says that obedience and faithfulness to God is more important than our current situation or our current status. We need to be present no matter where we are because God is going to, to use us where we are if we are willing to listen to him. Let's talk about deliverance for just a minute. What does it mean to be delivered? What happens when a delivery shows up at your door? You okay, you get excited, but what's there? What gets delivered? Your Amazon package. Yeah, for most of us, Amazon packages or a pizza. To be delivered means to be set free. It means to have freedom. That means that someone has to deliver you. Paul said if you can get your freedom, you should take it, but what happens if you don't? What happens if you never get freed from that situation? God may not always deliver us in the way we think that he should, but this does not mean that God is not listening or that God does not care. Going through something difficult may be what God uses in our lives so that we can help someone else, so that we can help them when they're struggling. It's happened in my life numerous times. I've told you about a lot of them, a lot of them I haven't. And I'm sure it's happened to some of yours. You've all probably dealt with difficult situations you couldn't really explain, but you've got to cling to God. It's one thing to read about depression and abuse, and it's something else to experience at first hand. It changes your perspective. It shows you the seriousness of it. It's terrible that we have to go through these things, and I definitely don't want to disregard the pain that you may be going through and that I've experienced. But God uses them for his glory and for our good whenever we're able to look at them as a chance to depend on him and not on ourselves. Let me read this paragraph from this devotion. Some of you got this devotion at Christmas. Um, at the Christmas party, it's called the Gen Z 30 Day Devo Challenge. Let me read this paragraph to you. It says, this type of deliverance is not a change of location. God is talking about how, we, how he will remove the fear from inside of us once we seek him. That's something we might have a tough time comprehending. We often ask God to take us out of our current situation or stage of life. And when it doesn't happen, we become angry at God for not listening to us. But what if, instead of praying for a change of location, we actually prayed for a change of heart? If instead of praying for God to end the storm, we ask for enough strength and courage to endure it. Our situation may not change, and it may become more difficult, but God can deliver us from that fear. So we don't have to be afraid. And one of the things about people and situations that try to control you, they do that through fear. They want you to be afraid. And if we don't have fear of what's going on, we can be faithful to Christ, and Christ can deliver us, not necessarily physically every time, but he can deliver us spiritually. Psalm 34, 4 states, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Once we can get to this place of understanding that God truly can use anything for our good and his glory, we can do what Paul is talking about next. And that's be about his business. Paul tells the Corinthians that they should be prepared for Christ to come back. Are you guys prepared for the rapture? Because you know he's coming soon. The world is speeding up more and more to where Christ can come back any day now. 
Be present in your current situation, but be prepared for the return of Christ. He throws out a few different scenarios. First of all, he says in verses 25 to 27, if you're not married, don't worry about it. There's benefits of not being married. You don't have the responsibilities that you would if you were married. You don't have to worry about taking care of your spouse, taking care of your children. Instead, you can be about the Lord's business. We talked about this two weeks ago, about being single and how if God calls you to the mission field or calls you into ministry, you don't have to worry about making sure it works for your family. You can just get up and go. And so being single has benefits. Even though the world tells us we have to be in a relationship, God tells us you don't have to. You can be single. And you can be more effective sometimes in ministry by being single. Second, he says that if you're engaged or married, stay that way. You are where God has you. There's going to be troubles in your life if you're married. You know, marriage is not always perfect. What he's talking about is the fact that there's going to be certain conflicts, demands, difficulties, and adjustments that singleness does not involve. But your commitment to your fiancé and to your spouse is extremely important. For those of you, if you do feel led to get married, that commitment is extremely important. This, again, is why you need to make sure that you are dating someone that is a Christian. Don't be dating someone that's not a Christian because they're going to drag you down. You need to go ahead and start praying for that person now that God is going to bring for you to be married to. You need to start praying now, even though you guys are in middle school. Start praying for that future spouse. Start praying that God will make you into the person that you need to be for your future spouse. And make sure that person is a believer in Christ so that you're not legally yoked. But regardless of which place you find yourself, ultimately he says to be ready. Let's look at verses 29 through 31. He says, But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened so that now, or from now on, those who have wives should be as though they had none, and those who weep as though they do not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For the form of this world is passing away. The last thing that Paul's going to tell us tonight is that regardless of our marital status or our socioeconomic status, we need to be ready to go. We need to be prepared for the rapture. At some point, Christ is going to return. That means fulfilling the call that God has placed on your life, being faithful to him and being a godly example no matter where you are. Live a life that is pleasing to the Lord and sets an example of what it means to truly follow Christ. You can't set an example if you're constantly distracted by the world. You can't set an example if you're distracted by friends. Don't be a Christian in name only, but also in action. There are too many people in the world right now that are calling themselves Christians, but they wouldn't know Jesus if he slapped them in the face. Know who your Savior is. Fall in love with who your Savior is. Read his words, spend time with him, pray. Do all the things that Scripture tells us to do to draw close to him. As we talked about earlier, God tells you to come as you are, and he's going to clean you up. You don't have to worry about fixing yourself in order to be with God. He doesn't say come as you are, and I'm just going to let you stay that way either. He doesn't say, I'm going to save you just for you to go back into your life of sin. Every time Jesus healed someone and saved their soul, he told them to go and sin no more. That means we have a responsibility when we are saved to make sure that we live a righteous life. That we don't keep dabbling in sin. We don't keep trying to push the limits to see how close to sin we can get before we fall down. We're supposed to set an example of what it means to live a holy life. And that means being appreciative of that salvation that Christ gave you. And living in a way that honors him and not in a way that fulfills your own desires. This also means not being attached to earthly possessions. We all have material things that we enjoy. I've got sentimental things that I won't get rid of. I've got a little bookcase that my great-grandma gave me. I've got this little decoy duck that my great-grandfather gave me. Neither one of them are worth very much, but they're worth a lot to me. But Christ is worth more. Christ is the most important thing that I have in my life, even more so than my family. Christ is more important than any of that. Now, I know we've been on a couple different topics tonight. We've kind of jumped around a little bit. But let me give you this as an ending. If you are not a child of God, come as you are. He can make you new. All it takes is knowing that you are a sinner, accepting Christ as your Savior, that he loved you enough to die for you even when you hated him, repenting of your sin and following him. If this is you, I'd love to talk to you after service. Don't be ashamed to stand up and say, I don't love Jesus. Because when you come to him, God's not going to be ashamed of you. Next, if you are a child of God, I want you to remember that you belong to the Savior of the universe, so don't be afraid. Your freedom comes from Him. He has placed you where you are for you to fulfill the very calling that He has put on your life. So remember that. And be prepared because it's coming back soon. So I'm going to leave you with a final question. Then I'm going to pray for you guys and you can go. 
What fears are holding you back from being the man or the woman that God...